They come from the bowels of hell. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Jungle worms and swamp rats run around your feet. I bought a dog that killed the calf that ate the canary. What is true? And once again, welcome back. Happy February. We're a month and a half into 2021 and already I feel better. Vaccines are pouring forth like sap from a tree in the dead of winter. And Trump escaped trying to get his own vice president murdered. But as the wise man once said, Poe buddies nerf it. To that end, I have summoned the smartest man in the world to help us suss this out. Greg Proops is on the show today. Greg's a terribly, terribly funny man and an old and dear friend of mine and the host of the eponymous podcast, The Smartest Man in the World. And together, Greg and I are going to try to make sense of, as I like to say, the modern scene. As for me, I suggest you all enjoy my new show, Hanging with Dr. Z. If you like this podcast, you will probably like Hanging with Dr. Z. Why not go to hangingwithdrz.com? H A N G I N G W I T H D O C T O R Z.com. Doctor is spelled out. And sign up for our YouTube channel. It is the best show in America, hosted by an orangutan, and there is competition. Hangingwithdrz.com. Now, lastly, if you are a Patreon supporter, You've known about Hanging with Dr. Z for some time. Our Patreon is simple. Five bucks a month makes you a Dana Gould Hour Sky Cadet, and you get extra stuff every month. A bonus interview segment, video content, just a little something-something for you, and a little something-something for us to keep the lights on here at the show. I've said it before, and I mean it sincerely. The Patreon makes the show possible, so thank you very much for contributing. Five bucks a month, and you get some crap. Go to danagool.com for details. And now, it's on to our filthy business. Our guest today on a seasonably gray, rainy day high atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf here in sunny Southern California, although not so sunny today. Well, it's still sunny. It's just sunny up above the clouds. Is nothing less than the smartest man in the world. Please welcome America's next door neighbor, Greg Proops. This is the sound of my voice. That was that was John Cameron Swayze-esque. Uh now, now I was thinking, uh, Greg. Now you, now Greg and I have we've. Let, let's just say right out of it, we know we're friends off off the show. Um, but the, uh, I was thinking the last time we did the show, I believe you and I were sitting in my kitchen, talking about how how Trump would survive losing to Hillary Clinton and what that yes, would do to his days. psyche. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was how right that was back when the show was called how right i am <laughs> right uh the, the the good part of it is and i'm taking refuge in this is that uh, uh he did actually lose to her yes he did that's right he did <laughs> he did but it didn't, i hadn't do two, much good i had two interviews like it was you and then right at the next one was it was it was you and then pete aronson and it was yeah. we had very similar conversations then Mike, after he won, Mike Murphy was on, and Murphy was talking about like maybe he'll grow into the job. Let's <laughs> give him a chance. In Mike's defense, he uh, was uh, you know one of the huge uh, anti-Trump Republicans. Yeah, there was, he was. There's two organizations: is the Lincoln Project 
And then there's another one called um, uh, RVAT, which is Republican yeah. Voters Against Trump. RVAT was Mike's. Uh, they put a lot of money. Unfortunately, they put it into Florida, and you just can't put enough money into Florida. No. Um, we keep salting this turd, but it doesn't taste like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but, uh, but uh, uh, you know, do, but everybody was like, well, we were completely wrong. Uh, and I, I have to say, and we can say this in, uh, I still, uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. It's alarming that he did lose that it was worse than we thought. Like, oh yeah. Because it happened uh, in slow motion. Like if you had said, Oh no, 400,000 Americans are going to unnecessarily die. There's mm-hmm. going to be an armed insurrection in the capital of a vote. There's going to be an armed organization of white supremacists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not going to be that bad. <laughs> right. That's the, uh, it was the extraordinary sci-fi scenario that uh, every crappy movie had anticipated, you know, yeah. from idiocracy to uh, what was I watching the day after tomorrow? I watched all the dystopias, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. and they were all completely accurate, but in, the, in but, one element. And the, but the reason those movies work better is because you you're instantly submerged in them. Whereas yeah. this, it, it happened by inches. It's, yeah. it's like, you know, to use my old analogy, it's like, you know, one day the ape is tying its shoes. That's all. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, it's wearing shoes. Oh, that's interesting. Then there's a tie. Oh, it's wearing a tie. Yeah. Then it's your boss. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it happens in slow motion. <laughs> well, you, you said to me uh, after it started, uh, it's Watergate every day. And yeah. by flooding the zone like that, by making it literally worse than Watergate every single day, because for four years, almost every single day had him do something that was demonstrably worse. Yes. I mean, Iran Contra was worse than Watergate and Del- and Herbert Walker pardoned everyone from that. Mm-hmm. So this whole pattern of there's no accountability is as old as time. The difference in Watergate was at least in Watergate, polite rules of society while undermining yeah. what the, you know, was like the market well, is of- people. This is the, if it the wasn't professional for wrestling. And Baker, right. yeah. Yes. They, they asked him to leave. I mean, they yes, basically and that's why said, he left. We can't win, so you've got to go. But no one did that for this guy. No yes. one had the balls or the temerity. If if Watergate was the Marcus of Queensbury rules, this now we're at the truck pole. Now we're at the uh, <laughs> we're, the professional wrestling level of yeah. There's no uh, there's no elegance to it anymore. No, it's no, a demo derby. There's it's no a, like Jeffrey a, Rush and Elizabeth whispering into the uh, whispering into the Pope's ear politely. It's just no, <laughs> junior no. samples. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no more Hal Holbrook in the garage murmuring uh, to yeah. follow the money. It's a, a, it's literally a shootout at the OK Corral, and yeah. the Clanton gang is the Republicans. Yeah, I don't understand. I, I, I don't, uh, I don't understand it. Then I do feel bad for my. I have a couple of Republican friends that are very principled people that have a different view of the role of government than I do, and uh, they are people without a country. They, you know. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they, they, they are, are as disgusted by it as you and I are. There um, are those people. That's what's interesting. Yeah, and and then there's the other like 30 million. Yeah, that's right. They're a minority. Unfortunately, they're, they're yeah. a big minority. Um, and it is, I'm truly, a, truly astounded uh, that he did lose. You know, I still wake up in the morning and like, mm-hmm. I don't have to, so I read the greatest quote and I don't want to give him the whole hour, but I, I read a great quote when he was president, is it mm. Trump doesn't govern the country. He harasses the country. Yeah. Yeah. And it is like the restraining order has been sent out. Like yep. he's not emailing me. He's not telling you. Know, it's like, I wake right. up in the morning and I don't leap for my phone to see if world war three started the night before. Right. And, and it's when they banned him from Twitter, not just the 24 hour ban, but when they banned him, right. that really, brought the temperature down i think and i feel like we're all suffering from trauma like you yeah, we all an, have ptsd that's totally in, in a we've year, been in abusive we're relationship gonna, it, yes and within a year 85 to 87 percent of americans are going to have a a shift at jumbo's clown room we're going to be throwing up our lunch we're going to mm-hmm. have every pt <laughs> we're just going to be like damaged kids that have been sent out in the world because daddy yeah. was abusive we're all going to be yeah. dating drummers it's right. <laughs> <laughs> Renting a place on Franklin. <laughs> working down exotic. by the airport. Working down by the airport. <laughs> right. So you can be close to the bar you like to go to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're, uh, it's uh, it's true. We've been, we've been abused. Uh, 
my dad was a great big tall New Yorker who would say things like, why is everybody so sensitive? When I was young, you could call a, uh, uh, you know, a, um, you know, and he just say yeah, every horrible. Sure. Episode. Of course. Yes. And mind you, he was Jewish <laughs> and, right, from Brooklyn sure. and still was this and fought the Nazis in World War II. He was a sailor in World War II. And, wow. uh, and then of course, by his forties and fifties, it was like, he voted for Nixon. He mm-hmm. uh, was bellicose. Um, I, I, and we're that was, age now. And, and, and people say like, like that, well, that happens to everybody at a certain age. Like it was yeah. a, the Churchill thing about anybody who is a, uh, you know, liberal when they're young, doesn't have a heart. And when they're conservative, if they're not conservative in the role, they right. don't have a brain. I'm, I'm mangling the quote. I'm not, I don't get more conservative as I'm older. <laughs> you know, it's, do you remember the question man in the Chronicle? Yeah. It was a little call. It had like six pictures and it would say, Alex, someone said they live in uh, on Jackson street and they're, uh, you know, uh, 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 a notary or whatever, or they work as a, in, in a uh, title company. And so I was sitting in fact, in Jackson square, and this is 1982. I worked in an office over on Bush and, um, battery. <laughs> I was a, a Schmendrick. Sure. And, uh, uh, I was sitting there eating my sandwich and the guy came up and when I'm the question man from the Chronicle, would you answer a question? And I said, I'd adore to, right? And he goes, uh, what's wrong with the world? And my answer from 1982 was old white guys who run corporations are ruining everything for everyone else because they control everything and they're evil. <laughs> and I was like, my politics haven't changed in no, over 40 years. I yeah. have, I'm from the Bay Area. I grew up my parents weren't my mother kind of liberal. She loved Clinton and JFK and stuff like that. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but my dad, I think, as far as I know, was a, a liberal during World War II and then sort of became a Nazi as a time grew on. And then uh, yeah. I had a relative tell me before this election, I reached out to some relatives. I'm not going to say who. And uh, just to k- take the temperature of the room, you know, mm-hmm. uh, see which way the wind, as I Af- say. After the election or, or before? Uh, before, before. Uh-huh. Uh, brought up like the whole who are you going to vote you know mm-hmm. hey braver man yeah. than I am. and one got back to me out of several and said i'm on your boat baby i hate this and my other got back to me and said it's just a pity there's two bad candidates <laughs> yeah, you know, which is such a late which is such a cop out and, uh-huh. and, you know obama was actually as bad as trump because of the corporate <laughs> tax. and like no no you're wrong no. you're wrong so i have to cut um them out and yeah, well my uh, my f- go ahead no well i mean i feel like there's a lot of comics who are doing a lot of di- brazen daring things and I'm not sure that I'm ready to talk to them when we're out of the containment for a while. Comedy, our too. colleagues. Yeah, I know. Comedy does seem to be like you're in a, a a barrel full of shit, and it gets harder and harder to keep it out of your mouth. Um, yeah. I I don't understand these uh, radical left right lurches that people take but it's also you know i i think part of it is and this is a you know i was talking to a friend of mine a really funny comic in new york you might know sam morell super funny and he's got two specials he's done two specials in the past two years and he's released them on youtube you know or amazon you know like he made them himself and he had yeah. them put up and and he says more people come up to me from my clips than from any special I've done or mm-hmm. any, you know, God forbid, like a, t- a Tonight Show. Or he goes, no, I like people just your clips get passed around, and that's what sends you stratospheric. Now that that is what mm-hmm. gets around is is clips, and so all of those when we were growing up, coming up, not growing up when we were coming up, you know, it was like, oh, if I could get on Letterman, right. that would be so great. Or if I could, and now that doesn't matter at all. No. Uh, you know, if you did Colbert or whoever, it'd be nice, yeah. but it doesn't move the needle. It hasn't moved it for a while. I think, yeah. I think the last time was the early nineties, mid nineties when Carson was still on. And uh, mm-hmm. for instance, uh, Drew Carey, 
was one of the last comics to get on Carson that kind of went national right after that. You know what I mean? Like he went from, he was of course already going and then he did his classic set with his classic look. Carson waved him over. And there's a picture in Drew's house. He kept much. I love him for this. He has the picture of him sitting with Carson. I saw, and I saw it. Yeah. So, yeah. Is that the one where he had the tie? Great. Is that yeah, the yeah, one where yeah. a guy falling? Yeah. In his, uh, yeah great. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, he's really, I think, Roseanne, you remember? She went national because sure. of Ellen a little bit earlier. Leto, mm-hmm. you know, going on Letterman was yeah. what, wasn't that what made him extra special huge? Yes, it was going on Letterman like every. I mean, month. he toured like a demon. Well, Letterman, when Letterman nice. was at his like peak, it. when Letterman was at his peak in the in the mid to late eighties, uh, Richard Lewis and Jay Leno uh, became mm-hmm. household became household names because of, and George Miller became household names just from going on those shows. George there, Miller, yeah, yeah. And there really isn't there really. I mean, it's fine. It's just it just changes and it's interesting to see it evolve. I like the fact that there are no gatekeepers in that regard. The 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 trick is. It's the law of unintended consequences and that uh, people realize it's what gets you passed around. It's what gets attention. And then there, and then the, the next realization is, well, what gets the most attention isn't always the most nutritious thing. Uh, you know, being, uh, nope. you know, I, I can get a lot more attention if I'm loud and, and awful and, because there's a lot of awful people right. that want to follow me, and and then you're in a then you're in a loop, and you're just a uh, and you're an awful machine, and uh, I think we're seeing a lot of that now, and it's uh, it's uh, sad, but uh, you know, as uh, it, it will it will it will wear itself out, and then something new and worse will happen. <laughs> yes, you said something to me before we were recording. Yes, certainly something worse will happen. Uh, the and you said uh, being angry all day about everything isn't like a normal emotional state, and it requires a lot of energy. And I think yeah, that's what usually you, you know, yeah, that, I, you I, talk it's, about. It's not something that you do by choice. It's uh, well, comedy is supposed to be a release. Like comedy is the big. Oh my God, you got close to the truth, but you did it with a funny voice and you jumped around, and so. Right we swallowed it. Like as Jennifer always says to me, I'm like, this joke never works. She's like, um, have you tried like doing it in character instead of being the bitter pill that you want? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do. I'm okay. up there going, the cops kill people. And it's like, you might make that funny. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, it's uh, true. So that was always, that's my favorite kind it. of comic. That's my favorite kind of like, comic yeah. that was like the, the, the guy that just does that and doesn't get a laugh, but keeps doing it because that's what Lenny Bruce would do. And he was a comic. <laughs> so this must mean that I'm a comic. No, no. By the time he yeah. did that, he had proof that he at least had been a comic. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's so don't, true. And I, yeah, I, ha- I fight against myself all the time. I have, a, well, I've done lines for years that just didn't work. And all I needed to do was go, well, I think it's to her, to her, to yeah. her. And then so everybody. The line, that, the line that you do that wouldn't get a laugh that you would do for years is about cops killing people. I'd be like pulling down a William Demarest reference that no one would get. <laughs> and I would, <laughs> and I would refuse to give it up. <laughs> yeah. Someone's going to get this. <laughs> but it's uh, but it's true and i and i yeah. found like in my little uh on you know twitter you do something and and you you touch that third rail and there's just a a um a prof- there's the comedy world and then there's the angry world mm-hmm. it is populated by a lot of former comics and they're not comics anymore. You might know them because they were comics, but they're not comics anymore. And they just make people angry instead of make them laugh. And I don't see why these worlds have to be still connected. Uh, we don't do the same thing. And I, I think that mine uh, certainly uh, leads to a more enjoyable life. Um, I'm One, I'm too busy to be angry all day. And uh, two, it's, it's one day this is going to get really profound and i don't mean it to be like one day you don't wake up and that's yeah. it and uh, all the anger that you had is worthless you know all those all the it's all the things that you're angry about now great that you try to change the world but it's also the, the anger that you poison yourself with is is utterly worthless yes that's a lesson i have to learn every you know, day martin luther I- king jr 
for all of his righteous indignation, enjoyed his life and enjoyed his family and was a big Star Trek fan. Not a lot yeah. of people know that. You know, you, you have, you, but then you have to live your life and you have to enjoy your life. That's true. He also enjoyed billiards quite a lot. He did. <laughs> and you weren't allowed to uh, swear around him. He asked people if they could stop doing that. And yeah. I love him for that. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was uh, a, he, Bayard, he, Bayard Rustin's partner was my ex-wife's uncle. So really? I have a weird connection to Bayard Rustin. Yes. Your ex-wife's uncle. Yeah. Well, he's a beautiful man. And the fact that, uh, they were also, uh, I, I hate to use the word, but, uh, tolerant of of him being gay like they yeah. accepted it you know yeah their acceptance is what makes some it more beautiful. than others <laughs> well some not at all but i mean yeah, yeah. they didn't let him speak of course at the <laughs> yeah. march for jobs yeah. and freedom but he was certainly there and yeah. uh, and he did organize the fucker and my god charlton heston was there you know yeah yeah that no, the, yeah no they were all uh it was it was a it was a it was a different time but yeah you you have to you also have to, and you have to live your life or, or they, because I, I guarantee you the people that you're angry at are living their lives. That's true. And they're just enjoying themselves. Also ginning up outrage isn't not fun for me. I prefer uh, it's satire exhausting. and lampoon, of course. Yeah. But uh, Jennifer, I do the podcast. We talk about uh, records that are coming out, jazz and um, places you can dig online and, you know, yeah. Fun, like I, I, I don't, I mean, we always curated books and art and lit and stuff, but now of course we just, you can't come on and go like another 25,000 people died today. Like <laughs> yeah, is, yeah. I'm a comedian. We're doing an entertainment show. And the, There's gotta know, the, be. The government has always, the, the political government has always been out of step with the cultural ferment, you yeah. know, at, at the height of, late 60s swing in southern california reagan was the governor yeah and nixon was the president yeah you know it's it's they've always been out of step and and culture evolves you know culture evolves on its own apart if you look at all of the culture wars of the 90s uh the conservatives lost every one of them mm-hmm Gay marriage, marijuana, uh, whatever else. They, they lost them all. Yeah. Uh, the political uh, war is, is a different animal, but the culture moves on its own speed. To dedicate yourself to screaming at the newspaper is a terrible waste of time and energy. Well, also, like you just said, uh, I'm and I'm not saying anymore. don't care. I'm not saying oh, don't no, care. No, not at all. But it's just, well, it, you're it, can't be your, it cannot be your life. There's a way to, yeah, to not just use your whole experience to just gin up outrage. Because yeah. no matter which side it's on. Uh, the uh, When I was little, uh, the idea of three women on the Supreme Court, uh, the idea of a uh, black woman being vice president, um, these were just ideas. They were being yeah. floated, but they weren't going to happen. Yeah. And so now I'm this age and now they've all happened. And yeah. So I always used to say to people, you can in the nineties, especially you can grind your little tiny little hands into your hips and stamp your feet, but there's going to be gay marriage. There's going to be marijuana, yeah. all those things. And they all did happen. And it's like, you can't hold that back. And that's why I think you're sealing this. Um, and what, what's surprising to me is the people that are, you know, that are, uh, that are supposedly not conservatives who are furious that Kamala Harris is the vice president because right? she was, when she was the AG of California, they did things that it's like, Oh, like, oh, oh, I get it. All you want is everything you want. And outside of that, you're happy to live in this culture. As right? long as you get everything you want <laughs> yeah. in the flavor, you want it in the wrapping paper of your choice at the time you specify, then you'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. That seems to be I about have terrible it. news for you. You don't yeah. know the country you live in. Yeah, you're the world doesn't wrong. fit. Yeah, you're li- <laughs> everything is great except you're in the wrong country. <laughs> is there a country though? You no, know, like there's not. I, to, point, I lived in point England. To, and- yeah, point to the paradise that you should be living in. Right. 
I lived in England and uh, uh, I've of course been all over Ireland and Scotland and Wales and all that jazz. And people would say to me, is it better than here? And I'd say, no, it just isn't here. And that's enough. (laughs) You know, it's just a change of scenery, the same problems, poverty. Look at them. They're a mess right now. They're, they're in a worse mess than we are to be honest. Yes, We're in it. Like we're in like the 1859 Missouri compromise period. (laughs) <laughs> and but with a yeah. black vice president, yeah, a woman black vice president. So mm-hmm. she made history on 15 counts, which is why they had to storm the Capitol. The fact and, that she won and she carries all that with her, and that Warnock and Ossoff the Jew and the black guy won in Georgia. Yeah. Literally it happened the day after. They couldn't wait. That was it. Yes. And and the fact was not only is she the vice president, she was the safe, obvious choice. Yeah. And, and it's a black woman. Was, was the, that was the fact that it's like, it, again, you're talking about a war of inches. Like mm-hmm. 400,000 Americans have been have died in the pandemic, but you don't really notice it because it's just a little bit every day and they don't report it and it's not on yeah. your porch. Yeah. And then suddenly you realize, you look at that number and you go, what? It's more people than World War II. Yeah. Uh, it happens gradually. It happens gradually. And you, right. and you, and you don't, you don't realize it. I now uh, get, you know, I'm, I go out every day, but I, I to do stuff, but uh, you know, we're all housebound. And, you know, now I'm like, uh, I'm, I get as excited as my dog when the mailman comes. Like mm-hmm. we both, we both run to the window and jump up and yeah. down. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I even know my mailman's name. It's Tom. Tom's yeah. here. <laughs> you know, yeah. we have, He's got stuff. Um, have you been doing? Uh, have you been doing uh, online gigs? Oh yeah, uh, Ben Glebe and Steve Hofstetter have that Nowhere Comedy Club. Yes, and uh, they uh, started it at the beginning. Thank fuck, they'd already been dabbling in it uh, mm-hmm. before. Like they'd done some Facebook live gigs. I think Ben was doing a whole set on, which he was kind of like, you know, jumping on it before we yeah. all. We're doing it. So they had the stuff together for when this happened uh, to make it happen right away. All it took was Zoom and all that. And so I do like three a month. Um, I stand up a podcast and then him and I do a show where we riff and generally get drunk and pass out in front of everyone. And then uh-huh. the standards are a lot lower. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, yeah. See, I'm, I haven't done a ton of <laughs> Zoom shows, but can you do bits? Like, cause yeah, I, I, yeah. I want that response. And yeah. So the thing about the Nowhere show that you'd like, Dane, is um, the audience, uh, you can put it on grid if you want. So you can see everybody. Right. And, uh, or choose not to. Uh, and they open their mics. So there's... Oh, so you do, you can hear them. Yeah. You can also hear people screaming and dogs and, uh, you know, yeah. fizzing and mystery noises and depth charges. and Yeah. You know, and I don't knows. know. And yeah, I would have to. Well, I managed to find a way to uh, do a show, but I figured out a way to have it cost thousands of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, a great model. Um, <laughs> yeah, we uh, buying it out in a paper for a stand-up show you're about to. It's do. yeah, it's premiering in February. <laughs> it's uh, uh, me, Rob Cohen, and Pete Aronson came up with. Uh, basically, it's Doctor Zayas's lost talk show from the 70s and it's space ghost with dr zayas i've Requiring. seen the clips and it's okay. awesome so yeah um so yeah i i found a way to spend spend money many thousands of dollars yeah uh on a joke that fewer than a thousand people will get i was gonna say that me you and matt weinhold like it's ex- <laughs> it's exactly right but uh but uh, you know i had to do something and it'll uh, it'll hopefully god willing it'll uh, it'll outlive me um but uh, it looks yeah, so good. It, it's no, it's ridiculous uh, and it's funny. But uh, uh, you know, again, I I finally, what is the, what's the hardest way to do this? What's the uh-huh. most, you know? It's well, it's like my podcast. What if every album was Smile? What if right, every? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> what is the most difficult way? Yeah, to you're do a perfectionist, Daniel. What can I tell you? I'm a lot looser. It, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like it's like Stanley Kubrick filming a bat mitzvah. All right, hang on. I need everybody <laughs> right. to come in again. <laughs> so, so, we're gonna reshoot this. Um, <laughs> I'm 15 now. Just walk yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> right. Comes back. He's retired. 
<laughs> yeah, there's a little. No, you can overthink things. I think. Well, <laughs> Jennifer's more that's perfectionist me. than I am. Like, I, it's not that I'm sloppy, but I will let shit go. And I also yeah. always I find uh, mistakes are funny, and you capitalize on them. You know, yes. like so. Sure. Uh, fortunately, I can run my mouth so that I can do that shit. But yeah, I know sure, what you yeah. mean. No, I didn't think of this comedy club, which would have been a better way to do it than on another person's platform. But we're all in this boat. Yeah. And then I haven't really, I have a couple projects I'm supposed to be writing on, and I haven't been able to press my mind into that at all. But now that he's gone, I feel like I don't have an excuse anymore because, mm -hmm. but then the revolution, of course, is taking over because, you know, yeah, well, he's like gone, he's, but he, yeah, he's gone, but he's not. He's he's no. uh, yeah. It's like uh, he's, the Confederacy's still here. The Confederacy's still here, and there's and there's you know there's going to be the the slicker version of him, and it, it, it's interesting to see, you know, as as we all know, you know, it's like, you know, the the Republican Party, you know, uh, banished him for three days before they went yep. come back. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's. Uh, you know, and there's a there's a deep bench of those clowns, and I don't know what the Democratic a couple bench. hundred right now. Yeah, yeah Mo so. it seems like most, most. Yeah, the forty five so. in the Senate and uh, the you know, hundred forty. Uh, I think we're in a reprieve now, but I don't know if it's a permanent reprieve. I don't know. Uh, no, I don't think it is. I think this is going to have to be a, just a big bloody legal fight too. Um, but fortunately. Uh, I think this new government will pursue it. He's yeah. already said that he takes white supremacy really seriously and that the DOJ is going to jump back into action here. Like, for instance, they picked up that Ricky Vaughn the other day. That meant that for four years, that bad actor was running free and the DOJ and the FBI just yeah. hands off. Hands off. You know, I never thought about that, but that's, tr that's true. He interfered in the 2016 election. He was one of the main actors that did it. And like, and they yeah, just sat on it. And they didn't do anything until... No, that's the difference. You see, they picked him up, like, what, three days ago? In they, Palm five Beach. Five days after they're elected, they picked him up and, like, yeah. In in Palm Beach. Uh-huh. Wasn't Palm he Beach. in Florida? Well, I think he yeah. was in Florida. But, I mean, they have a hot list. You know they do. They have a fucking hot list. God, and... I never even thought of that. Like, yes, but of that's course, the... they've known who this guy is for 40 that's years. That's how many, three, three um, AGs and one acting AG didn't do shit. Or the, no, there was two. There was the other guy who had the, the my, what was it, the hot tub time machine guy? Remember him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bald motherfucker. He was AG2, yeah. wasn't he, for yes, a minute? The yeah, acting AG, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. Rosenstein and, sat on it. Barr sat on it. Session sat on it. Yeah. Well, the first thing they did was dismantle, like, the Civil Rights Division. So, like, yes. uh, that's all put back together now, I think. And um, that is going to make a huge difference. They also put up permanent fence around the white house which well, uh is pretty gross and shouldn't be there uh but it also speaks to how much i think they are sending a signal to the fbi the capitol police all the law enforcement agencies and the military we don't trust you not only that and i think this is <laughs> yeah th that We're, is absolutely we really don't trust you we have to have our own praetorian guard for real yep. It was July 7th, 1908, and it was hot in upstate New York. In the little town of Sand Lake, Hazel Drew, 20 years old and quite beautiful, with an aquiline nose and blonde hair that she wore up in a stylish bun, was walking along Taberton Road near Teal's Pond. For a beautiful woman to be walking alone at dusk along Teal's Pond was not outright dangerous, but it was downright unwise. Teal's Pond was off the beaten path and visited mostly by squirrel hunters and fishermen. Now, earlier that evening, Frank Smith, a young farmhand who was, by all accounts, dim-witted, hailed a horse-drawn wagon down for a ride. The man driving the wagon was named Rudolph Gundrum, and he pulled over and picked old Frank up. And not long after that, the two men passed and waved hello to Hazel Drew as she was walking on alone. 
Smith turned to Gundrum and said, That's old man Drew's oldest daughter. Four days later, Hazel Drew's body was found floating in Teal's Pond. The autopsy revealed the cause of death to be repeated blunt trauma to the back of the head. Everyone loved Hazel Drew. She worked as a governess, which is a sort of live-in combination nanny and school teacher for the family of Edward Carey, who was a local engineering professor. The Carey family reportedly loved Hazel. But as her murder was investigated, it was revealed that all was not what it seemed to be with Hazel Drew. For one thing, she had recently quit her job as a governess with the Carey family unceremoniously just a few days before. Further investigation revealed that in recent years, she had been, somewhat mysteriously, living far beyond her meager means. Records revealed that she had been traveling frequently and inexplicably to Albany, Boston, New York, and Providence. No one that knew her, no one in the Carey family, knew anything about these trips or why she would be taking them. Her suitcases and her closet at home were filled with tailor-made clothes well beyond her financial means. In addition, not one, but two silk kimonos and a wrapped packet of love letters were found among her effects. Again, all of these revelations were a surprise to anyone who knew Hazel. It seemed that she had a secret life. Scandalous in this era, beyond the pale, in 1908. The suspect list was small, but at first, obvious. The investigation was led by Rensselaer County District Attorney Jarvis P. O'Brien, and the first person questioned was Frank Smith, the old dim-witted farmhand. Frank Smith spoke pretty openly about his affection for Hazel Drew and gave the police two or three different versions of his own story. His name was only cleared after corroborating alibis verified the more dubious parts of his story, convincing the police that, no, he, he was innocent. Not too bright, but innocent. Frank Smith's removal from the suspect list left a large void that was filled with a wide array of dubious characters. Hazel Drew's uncle, William Taylor, who locals described as surly and melancholy, lived on a farm about one mile from Teal's Pond, which gave him access. A local dentist had reportedly proposed to Hazel on numerous occasions and been rejected every time. There was also a rumor going around that she had been dating a train conductor. That would explain all the trips. And then there was Henry Cramroth. Cramroth was loaded and ran a local resort which had been supposedly hosting, quote, strange happenings and orgies, unquote. I personally consider an orgy a strange happening in and of itself, but hey, that's me. I'm simple folk. The police pursued many leads, and the story went national, at least the 1908 version of national. But sadly, Hazel Drew's killer was never found. As the decades passed, all that remained of the Hazel Drew story was a local legend of the Teal Pond Ghost. But no leads, no suspects, no justice for Hazel Drew. Let's jump forward now. Let's say... We move forward about a little over 70 years. David Lynch is one of Hollywood's hottest directors. His cult hit Eraserhead has caught the attention of Mel Brooks. Yes, that Mel Brooks. And Mel Brooks, who, with his producing partner, Stuart Kornfeld, hired David Lynch to film a screen adaption of the Broadway hit The Elephant Man. David Lynch's The Elephant Man was a hit and a critical darling. David was offered to direct a big-budget science fiction film. That film, which was released in 1983, was called Return of the Jedi. David Lynch didn't make it, but he was offered to make it. I was asked uh, by George uh, to uh, come up to see him and talk to him about directing, which would would be the third Star Wars. And I had next door to zero interest. But David did have enough interest, apparently, to answer Dino De Laurentiis' call to make a film adaption of Frank Herbert's Dune, 
Although, if you ask David about it today, he's not so sure. Um, he called me and uh, asked me if I would read this book. I wasn't 100%. Um, I, I don't know quite how that happened. That's my one, uh, in my mind, uh, big failure. Dune took about three years to make and cost a reported $45 million, which is about $140 million in today money. It was a critical and financial disaster. Lynch bounced back in 1986 with his masterpiece, Blue Velvet, and was sitting pretty as far as Hollywood was concerned. David was brought in by Warner Brothers to develop a film about Marilyn Monroe, based on the then best-selling book Goddess, which floated the idea that Marilyn Monroe's tragic death was at best a cover-up, at worst, a murder. Lynch worked with a writer named Mark Frost, who came from television. He made his bones on The Six Million Dollar Man and made his name on Hill Street Blues. David and Mark's script was called Venus Descending, and put the blame for Marilyn Monroe's death squarely at the feet of John and Robert Kennedy. And Warner Brothers said, uh, no, we're not going to make a movie that implies that. So Lynch and Frost changed the name of the protagonist from Marilyn Monroe to Rosalind Ramsey, resubmitted the script, and Warner Brothers said, uh, no, we're not going to make a movie that implies that. So... There was no secret to how the Marilyn Monroe project died. But Lynch and Frost were good friends by now, and they collaborated again on a script called One Saliva Bubble. One Saliva Bubble centers around the small town of Newtonville, Kansas, where a top-secret government experiment has resulted in several citizens switching personalities. The film was set up with Steve Martin and Martin Short to star. Steve Martin, Martin Short directed by David Lynch, with a script by David Lynch and Mark Frost. And it fell apart. Around this time, David Lynch had lunch with his agent, who suggested that he turn his hand to television, because television makes more money. Lynch was not that interested, but his agent, Tony Krantz, suggested he examine small-town America, the way he did with Blue Velvet. This is the perfect advice from an agent. Do that thing that you've already done that we know works, but do it for more money this time. At first, Mark Frost suggested a Dickensian approach, analyzing multiple lives in a small town located somewhere in the North Dakota Plains. The show would be called North Dakota. Now, one of the influences of the proposed show was the 1960s primetime soap opera Peyton Place, so Lynch and Frost took a look at it. But after seeing it, they decided to design the town before they created the characters and the show based around them. So the first thing to go is the location. If you're going to create an interesting town, you're not going to do it in the plains of North Dakota unless you like talking about, you know, plains. They didn't want plains. What's the opposite of plains? Uh, peaks. So now the town was moved to the Pacific Northwest, the mountainous, piney Pacific Northwest. And the show was called Northwest Passage. But what they needed was a hook, what is called in screenwriting an inciting incident, the event that kicks off the action. It was then that Frost drew upon the stories he had heard as a youth vacationing at his grandmother's home in upstate New York. The story of the Teal Pond Ghost, a young, attractive blonde woman, seemingly upright, by the book, a model citizen, who apparently, after her death, left in her wake clues of a dark, secret life, who was found washed ashore in a body of water, and Hazel Drew became Laura Palmer. And the rest, as they say, is television. Come 
And now, on with the show. One of the results of January 6th is that it made the uh, homeland security apparatus of the United States look bad. Mm -hmm. Like they were Nazis. Yeah. And they don't like to, they don't like to be global clowns. No, and they were, uh, are. Yeah. So I think somebody said, uh, uh, it was a, it was an article I read that, uh, oh no, there's a deep state. It's not what you thought it was, (laughs) but it's awake now and it's looking for you. (laughs) Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Now the national security apparatus of the United States is angry and it's looking for you. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, they got caught out. And so I think that's why they're pursuing all the. And just uh, stone stup- cold stupidity. I mm-hmm. mean, we, we don't, this is too obvious to even mention, but like these are people who don't want to get a vaccine because they don't want the government tracking their movements and then they live stream when they attack the government. I was going to say, they, they broadcast every moment of it. <laughs> it's, it's, and it's, it's, they smoked stone. weed and they defecated oh, and, yeah. they, and yeah. they did the most awful things. The yeah, we don't know. List. We don't know. We don't know a smidge of what the of the gnarliest stuff that happened. It's no, we just, don't. We yeah. only know the, the injury list came out the other day and eyes were lost, ribs were cracked, spines were crushed. Like it's real serious. The casualties, 140 and how many dead cops too, including yeah. one who was a Trumpkin. Yeah. You know, but, I mean, you know, they're all there. And uh, what I didn't realize was that African-American, I guess black. I don't think you say African-American anymore. Yeah. What I didn't realize was that black cop was... I didn't know what he was doing because I watched it in real time. Right. I didn't know what he was doing. He was leading them away from the senators. Yeah. It was amazing. And then he warded off that group and no shots were fired. He yeah. shoots his thing out and he wards them off and they get no, they back he, down. That guy should get the, you know, they should give that guy Rush Limbaugh's Medal of Freedom. Well, exactly. He, you may have noticed at the inauguration, he was um, Kamala's personal bodyguard. Yeah. Yeah. And they I had him there. Yeah. Because um, he's a hero. He was also a combat hero in, in Iraq. So he's just that guy. But yeah. the irony of being chased by a group of white Nazis and you're the black uh, uh, cop who's there to protect the Senate. Literally, they were about to break the Senate doors down and maybe hang Mitt Romney. Yeah. Or the vice president. Well, that one was the one that I can't get over, Dane. It's like, so they transgressed so far that they did that. And we know for a fact that Trump's most serious ass kissing acolyte was the number one target. Yeah. They didn't talk about it after they didn't talk about it on the day. He didn't phone him. Pence was phoning the white house Mm -hmm. and they didn't take his call, you know, like, um, and then they didn't speak for a week and it's the big elephant in the room. Like, so you were going to kill the vice president to preserve the presidency. And that's that. How come? I mean, you know, I don't want to be the one that's the thing uh, that is the weirdest thing. I always believed that he was saying all of those things to protect his ego, like that he could never admit that he lost, which in and of itself is historically a pussy move. You know, for a guy whose whole thing is how tough he is. Yeah, all he did he was whine about how everybody's needed. He is historically, he is, for a guy whose whole thing is how tough he is, he is by definition the biggest pussy Mm-hmm. on earth so i always knew that he would say those things to protect his ego but then you're like no he really did think he could overturn the election yeah like he really did think he could strong arm his way through this i mean d- d- he's not a chess player he was he was not thinking about what was going to happen a week later it's just it's alarming to me He found a a willing accomplice at the Department of Justice that was fourth or fifth down that was going to, remember? I was going to overturn in Georgia, yeah. Yeah, and then they were going to win. And somehow that was going to win it. And they actually found a lawyer in the Justice Department who was willing to perform this charade. We're going to find out so much more. The giant meeting. And it was only because a group of high place goes, you know, we'll all resign if you do this. And that is the weird thing. It's Yeah, the Justice Department guys actually said we're all walking out. Right. But it was just because they didn't, you know, it's so funny because the, the, the system worked by crack, like by hairline fractures 
it worked. That some people mm-hmm. just it didn't work because the checks and balances and the stop, you know, it's like the, the reverse no. of get smart where the door is just clang shut. Right. None of them clang shut. It was always at the last minute, somebody had a crisis of conferences. I can't. Yeah. You Including know? Trumpkins. Yeah. Who avowed Trumpkins. Yeah. The poor a state, of, the state officials in Georgia who are all Nazis to a person were not going to be bamboozled. They were like, we counted it three times by hand and I'm not. Yeah. That's it. It's over. Yeah. And stop asking. And Trump thought he could gin up the big lie and and then the storming of the Capitol, maybe kill a few key people. I think Nancy and Mike Pence were probably first because that's the line of succession. And then, oh God, I'm, you know. Yeah, I'd better restore well, order. Look, uh, after Caesar was assassinated, Mark Antony and Augustus, you know, fought a running. They were off again, on again. And then they, he finally got Antony to kill himself in Egypt or whatever. And the first thing he did was put an honor guard around himself. And declare himself like first citizen, he wouldn't take the title king. And for 50 years, he was an emperor without being called an emperor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. when he died, he was a god. Um, yes. And I think that's kind of the. Oh, oh, and when they got back, they purged everybody that was on the enemies list. They killed yes. them all and took all their money. And that was, I think, the plan on this one. And it's amazing. And the only person I got to give her credit, like the the only person that is like not playing fair is like is uh, AOC, who's the only one that's going. Uh, no, remember you tried to kill yeah. me three weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, everybody else is like, well, it's oh, no. moving I, through the system. Nancy and uh, uh, Chuck, or I watched interviews with them both, and her speaking, and they're going to pursue this. I mean, this isn't. Oh, it's yeah. not dropped, and it's not. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, but she's the only one that is vocally going, no, uh, people were trying to kill people. Well, Oh, no, what's your name saying? it? Uh, and uh, Corey Bush, of course, today, because she said uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene threatened her in the hallway, so they moved her office and stuff. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene is, is uh, everybody's honor this week because it was revealed what we already knew, and she should have never been in Congress, is right. that she's a crockpot, and she's yeah. got a violent past like Boebert does. Uh, they're law-breaking types. They're they're know nothing types. Right. But they're the epitome of the party right now. There's yes. no fracture in the party. Yeah, no, I'm, if you ask me, fifty-fifty, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the next president, or kicked out of the party, fifty-fifty. Right. It's she's not an anomaly. No, she's what it's about, and that's the part that makes uh, the Mitt Romney wing or of the three of them uncomfortable because they liked it when everybody wore a suit and tie and was nice the watergate the watergate style of doing it right and then uh, that's gone though that's gone Mm -hmm. you've already pulled the middle ground out you can't attack the capitol and then have representatives who actually support attacking the capitol and then when there's a chance to repudiate the president for doing it nobody does it and still have any credibility I don't know what the behind closed doors conversations are. It might be one of those things that, you know, we can't shock and awe this. We yeah. just like, are they doing, uh, you know, I don't know if they're doing the uh, Munich style. Yeah. Uh, it's just like one by one, you know, you're going to go out to the tool shed in six months and it's going to be a pop. Yeah. <laughs> and right. We're not going to see you again. I trust that they're not going to let it go, but I don't know what the plan is. I don't think well, they want me to know what the plan is. No, we we, we need an Albert Speer. You know, we need the the one not, thoroughgoing Nazi who is the closest yeah. to him to all of a sudden say they were all really stupid and violent, and that you didn't really like them at the end of the day, which is what <laughs> Speer did at Nuremberg. He yeah. threw everyone under the bus, even though he is completely close with Hitler. Yes, and uh, yes, said they were all stupid and venal, and they were drunk all the time and took drugs all the time. He he really told. He said they were perverts and he hated their perversity. And this group, to me, seems like the same group. The Bannon. Uh, no, they are. Uh, they are. Well, it's uh, also the, Mulvaney. The, uh, the 9-11 Navarro. hijackers. The 9-11 yeah, hijackers. Larry, Larry Kudlow, uh, yeah. Scott Atlas, Chad Wolf. They're all drunk. They're all drugged up. They're all oh, Don Jr., yeah. Kimberly. Yeah. And, and they really are that. Yeah, they're Nazis. But like the Nazis weren't like 
a finely they tuned machine. Yeah, they, were a lot of, they weren't really the master race. <laughs> uh, no. And this, yeah, it's important to remember like the, the, that. Yeah, the guy who the guy who came up with the idea of the per, you know of the perfect human specimen had one ball and <laughs> severe stomach disorder. <laughs> and as I like to point out, a non-smoking vegetarian. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he. Um, they had a party in the bunker, like the, you know, the day before he shot himself. I mean, it was, yeah. you know, <laughs> I mean, if you want an analogy for having parties, COVID parties that the Republicans seem to breathe like oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. And now, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, friends of ours that, uh, you know, comedians are by nature anti-authoritarian. Yeah. But w- that, that doesn't apply to everything. As the, yeah. I know a lot of people like do live shows or they go out without a mask because it's it's the anti-authoritarian move. Yeah. But it's also comedians aren't supposed to be willfully stupid either. Yeah. You know, and that and at is. the end of the day should win. Some rules are good. Yeah. You know, they, right. Not yeah. not driving 90 miles an hour through a school zone at two in the afternoon. That's a great rule. Right. <laughs> that's why i always thought anarchists in that anarchy thing was the stupidest part of punk i understood the impulse because late 70s politics were such a shit pile right. as they are now but uh uh on one side let's be honest the other side isn't the other party yeah we're not nazi seditionists white yeah. supremacists we embrace well, our but well now when they say that both sides are the same that really only mm-hmm. applies to the fact that well they're they're both sides there, that's the same but <laughs> yeah. outside of that not really no, there is no uh but uh, anarchy i always thought was a really privileged position you know smashing everything up is a terrible idea for everyone who has less than you and uh <laughs> yeah. like you yeah. say not wearing a mask to me the first yeah that photo uh, of sid vicious walking down the street with a swastika didn't age well at all for right some, yeah. Yeah, no, and, and no. again it's like you know yeah but by I the like, way these are irish guys from north london where sure. they were persecuted they were pushed into that neighborhood right. and it was also <laughs> yes true and it was all also, whole like, bands irish sid vicious <laughs> sid vicious appealed to me when i was 14 yeah uh and it's like uh yeah, somebody said it was i think it was the i don't even know his name the guitarist for queen the guy that refused Brian May. The guy that refused to update his hair. Brian May, yeah. Yeah. With the big fluffy hair. Yeah. Yeah. He has the same hairstyle that Lorraine Newman has in the film Holy Moses. <laughs> but Brian May, Brian May, who in some interviews said, uh, well, you know, Sid, who was a pure idiot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah, you didn't want to hang out with these guys. <laughs> uh, no, and then Johnny's made that horrible turn to the he's Mr. Brexit now and whatnot. Yeah, well, it's, I mean they all it's it's really fun when you're 14. It's really it's great when you're 14. But uh yeah. I think the first rule of comedy is like uh being a a physician, uh first do no harm. <laughs> right, because I, I don't mean psychologically or comedically, of course, do what you like, but um not wearing a mask and performing in closed clubs where I've been going through it this morning, Dana. Uh, yeah. Jen Kirkman hit me to a website that this guy is chronicling live photographs from all these clubs where audiences are just all together screaming and mm-hmm. the comments on stage. There's a deadly pandemic going on. You're being an idiot. Stop doing it. Yeah. I don't understand. I don't understand. Yeah. You're not only exposing everyone in the room to it, which means they're all going home and they're asymptomatic. Well, to the they live they're with. young. Yeah. Right. They're young, so that means they're going to the mall, the movie theater, the drive-in, the thing, the thing, thing. Because a lot of states, everything's open still, man. For real. I know. I mean, it is one of those things. You have to learn every lesson the hardest way possible four times, and then you'll start to listen. And it's just arrogance. I never understood doing an eight hour show. Yeah. You know, it's like people, the staff doesn't want to be here that that's a whole show. No. <laughs> no. like, let people go to work. It's stupid. Yeah. yeah. I, I've never understood that either. Yeah. Well, that's the thing that's in sharp focus with the zoom thing is, uh, turning, turning back to our, our craft that we've abandoned. I try to keep the shows at like an hour and a half. And then you do like a little video meet and greet yeah, after, yeah, which yeah. is fun. So I, I like that part. Cause when I used to do the podcast live, 
I would talk to the audience before, which I would never do at a stand-up show because you have to have yeah, some you magic. Gotta, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. to have magic. But in a podcast, you don't. The podcast is a real hands-on, you yeah, know, egalitarian. Like, right. I get to yeah. talk to everybody, shake their hand, give them a sticker. I can't be doing that for what two more years now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, hopefully a year, but yeah, hopefully my prediction is smooth with people. And on, then, um, my prediction is Halloween is going to be off the hook this year. That's I'm I'm aiming well, for the I'm, end of October. Me, me too, buddy. <laughs> With the Zoom, you have to kind of try and to it'll, recreate But it'll that. still be like werewolf surgeon, mermaid <laughs> surgeon. So, you know, it's everyone's still... <laughs> a lot of mummies. Oh, oh my God. My, my favorite one I saw a kid was a zombie mermaid. I was like, yes! What? <laughs> a nice combo. <laughs> right? There's two things I never put together. Yeah. Although it was Bloody Einstein. That Aquaman's mascot on the Aquaman cartoon was Porpy Porpoise, which delighted me that that character actually existed. We were saying it and riffing it here at the house. <laughs> and then I looked it up online and my God, I, found I thought it was, it was a seahorse. I thought yeah, it was a seahorse. Yeah, he did. But in the comic book, it was, but on the, evidently in the cartoon, one of the peripheral mascots was poor P porpoise. You know, Submariner, a, Submariner and Aquaman. Oh, I love the Submariner. Like, but like so limited in terms of their superhero ability. If, if, if a, a crim, all a criminal has to do is get to the beach. I was going to say, dry land. <laughs> dry land solves everything. Just evolve. Yeah. It was like the show Ironsides. If you could just get up the and stairs, you're safe. <laughs> I loved Ironsides. I just ran it. Like, I'll do another show, but I don't want to stand. Yeah, okay. Right? We, we've got an idea for you. Uh, so Lionel Barrymore, who uh, uh, is one of the great actors and sure. character actors of all time. I always thought something was wrong with him. Uh, because he went from standing to a wheelchair to like a bed or whatever, like Ethel Barrymore never, you know, like her last five movies, she's in a bed. And I always thought like something happened. I, I never knew. I never dug. And then we were watching a Lionel Barrymore movie and Jennifer goes online several years ago. And she's like, um, he was a heroin addict. So he just didn't, he could play. He could still just act. Just didn't want to. But also. Mr. Potter. Key Largo, mm-hmm. all those movies where he's in a wheelchair. It's just like Lionel Barrymore based, and uh, and Lionel at will holds one of my favorite titles, non military title, but a title mm. nonetheless. Orgy Master. Oh no! From yeah. who bestowed this on him? The Hellfire Club or something? Uh, yeah, some yeah. He was uh, he he was the guy. In, orgy in, uh, Master. Yeah, Orgy Master Lionel. I I demand to speak to the Orgy Master. <laughs> <laughs> Fourth thing, we're out of avocado. We're out of spinach dip. Where's the orgy master? Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, <laughs> send him over this minute. He's wearing like a sommelier's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, badge and pendant. You have to get uh, downtown. There's a problem with the orgy. <laughs> hold on a moment. Let me put on my rubber gloves. <laughs> we're trying to have a nice orgy here, people. Please. Order, right? order. <laughs> well, little little Richard uh, was once described as, uh, as well as being one of maybe the greatest artist of all time in American history. He also was described as a drug addict's drug addict and a pervert's pervert. And there's a quote from him where they were having an orgy and someone interrupted it by coming into the room. And he said, I was like, excuse me, we're having an orgy here. <laughs> and- <laughs> A drug addict's drug addict and a pervert's uh, per- Mark Critch, this Canadian comedian, uh, we were at digging in, uh, uh, in, where does he live? Way out, Nova Scotia. And um, he goes, have you ever read Little Richard? We started talking about rock stars uh-huh. we have met. And he told me this great story about Brian Wilson. He goes, me and my brother worship Brian Wilson. And we went to see him in concert. It was The Smile, you know. Mm-hmm. And we got backstage because they're, you know, fancy Canadians. And... Um, <laughs> He goes, we get to meet him, we get up to him, and we go, Mr. Wilson, we just want to say, like, you know, you're such an idol, you're so influential, you know, on and on. Yeah. And Brian Wilson goes, it's my birthday today, they got me a cake. <laughs> and he goes, I just, you know, uh, but then he, get, he said, Do you, have you read Little Richard's biography? And I hadn't, and he mailed me a copy. And it's not just licentious, it's, What's it's the book? lurid. Oh, it's great. And he's, 
He, and then you know, he the, cures the, himself. The, okay, go ahead, and then I'll blow your mind. He cures himself of being gay by becoming a minister in the eighties, which is yes, just I remember that. Yeah, I remember sensational. That. Yeah, it's just, but it's really the greatest one I've ever read. I so I'm being interviewed. He goes, I threw, I went to the, I gave my life to Jesus, and I went to a bridge, and I threw all my jewelry into the river. I said, Lord, take it. I took off my rings and my necklaces, and I threw them into the river. And oh God, I wish I knew where that river led out. <laughs> He, I, I, the best like, show business biography I've ever read, Winch by Paul Winchell. Really? S- screaming fights with his mother at her grave. Oh my God. He built a ventriloquist dummy of himself so it could argue with his mother's ghost while he was doing other things. When did he become like a violent? like right-wing Nazi? Um, or was he always? Winchell? It, didn't he turn people in during the commie hunt? I don't know. That's not in the book. I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know that. I know he was the voice of Tigger we're talking about. Oh, that's Paul Winchell. You yeah, said Paul Walter Winchell. Winchell. Oh, no, I meant Paul Winchell. Paul Winchell. <laughs> Paul Winchell. Winch. <laughs> No, Walter Winchell's book is called Winchell. I have both. Walter Winchell Walter was Winchell, Walter Winchell was always a commie uh, chasing asshole. Yes. No, Paul Winchell. Uh, the oh who direct, the director of the Brady Bunch. By the way, commercial. no one's listening anymore. We lost them with Winchell. And then the miscommunication over whether it was hilariously no. Paul Winchell of Winchell Mahoney Time or Walter Winchell. Yes. <laughs> <What's it>? Paul <laughs> Hello, Paul Winchell is his book, Winch, it's the greatest show business biography of all time. I was I, wondering I, why Walter Winchell built a ventriloquist dummy <laughs> when Paul Winchell was the ventriloquist. Walter Winchell had Paul Winchell build a Walter Winchell ventriloquist dummy. Yes. And it ends... Scrubbing levels. It's, it, yes, this book, it ends with like an operatic fight where Jerry and Knucklehead Smith join him in a fight with his mother's ghost at Hollywood Forever Cemetery. Wow. It it is insane. It is insane. That sounds good. Um when I was really little and I lived in Lancaster, um there was a a morning show called Winchell Mahoney Time. Yes. And he was he had on the snail and Jerry and yep. Knucklehead and it was I will I did a thing on this probably like four episodes back where I read segments of it. I'll just send you the link to that uh, and save you because the book is literally like it's self-published, it's like three hundred dollars. But yeah. uh but it's that sounds good. It's worth it to hear it. Yeah. The Jennifer Walter wanted Winchell me book. to tell you one last line of uh, Barrymore story. I almost said Lionel Newman because now we're in that hole. <laughs> it's Lionel Atwill and Lionel Barrymore versus Paul and Walter Winchell. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, uh, Barrymore used to get real high at his house and take out paint and paint rooms. So there's whole rooms all over his house that the walls are painted with these wild drawings and and slapdashery. And yeah. So, there was great. Uh, I'm sure you know this, but um, when she was first out of rehab, Drew Barrymore was on Arsenio and he asked her in utter seriousness if there was alcoholism in her family. <laughs> um, here's my here's my digits. Call me if you're going to use. <laughs> was there That's any so drinking funny. in the Barrymore? Let me check. <laughs> <laughs> on the podcast reach for the sky David Goldbaum This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the Internet. Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagould.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom, peace out, peace out, you want me, peace out.
Boom.